Good morning, everybody. My name is Nicola Barrett, Chief Corporate Learning Officer at Goys Weather Business School. Um, welcome to Business Over Breakfast with Emory Executive Education. This month, we're focusing on insights on the very current topics of digital currencies, IoT, NFTs, and blockchain. So if the number 86 billion um, surfaced in your papers or on your uh, digital feeds in the last 24 hours, um, maybe you know that that was the valuation of Coinbase at its market debut. To put that number into perspective, only 93 companies in the S&P 500 have a higher market value than Coinbase. Last time uh, we met, Professor Ben Kaczynski helped us understand the history and evaluation of digital currencies. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Roop Singh to Business Over Breakfast. Roop is a digital strategist and founder of Intuit Factory and a guest lecturer in our executive MBA program at Goizueta. He's recognized as a thought leader on blockchain, as well as, I understand, a thought leader and a, a master practitioner of um, uh, meditation and, uh, the, and um, shares the benefits of mindfulness practice uh, in various ways with the community. And given that valuation of Coinbase, uh, Rup, you might have a new audience <laughs> of business folks who need, who need to uh, bring a little calm into their lives. I look forward to uh, you, Rup, taking us through both the benefits and necessity of blockchain in the global marketplace and really helping us understand not just how blockchain works, but also why uh, blockchain is important and how do we go about deciding if and when, you know, we take the step that Tesla and Visa and PayPal have taken to actually accept digital currencies as, as payment. As with most sessions, uh, Rup is going to spend about 30 to 35 minutes uh, sharing his insights, uh, followed by a fireside chat, uh, sort of Q&A style with um, Ben Kaczynski. Uh, so please uh, do enter your questions into the Q&A section and um, we will do our best to get those answered today. If you are looking for ways to find some order, uh, given all of the mind expanding possibilities in the world that face us, and build your competence in solving ambiguous, uh, messy problems, I do invite you to join us for Structured Problem Solving with two of your favorite uh, favorites from Business Over Breakfast, Lynn Siegel and Patrick Noonan. Uh, that program kicks off in May, so uh, please uh, I invite you to check that out uh, and we will, put, um, we will put some information of that in the chat too. Um, so that course along with Roop's uh, mindfulness lessons might be just what we all need. Uh, to put ourselves and our businesses on a healthy and prosperous path. Anyway, um, that's all from me. Uh, over to you, Roop, and uh, I hope everybody enjoys the morning along with me. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Nicola. Good morning, everybody. Coinbase. So, the pollen count in Atlanta is high, and in other news, Coinbase went public yesterday through a direct listing on NASDAQ, choosing not to go through the New York Stock Exchange route. And it is being valued at 76 billion, if you believe these numbers, or at 85 billion, if you count all the options and awards uh, that were done in the private market. Regardless of what that valuation is, there are some things that are clear. When you think of this space, you think the, the valuations are absurd. If you look at Coinbase as just as an asset, uh, crypto asset exchange, which depends on price of Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, and fees, which inevitably would be driven down by its competition. But valuations, as professors would tell us, have always been about data and the narrative. And it is the narrative that is being valued here. And what is that narrative? That narrative is of disruption. That narrative is of crypto assets as a new class of assets. That narrative is of a crypto economy. That narrative is of blockchain as a foundational technology. So here's what it does to the space. Three things. It legitimizes crypto assets and uh, as a new class of asset. 
it legitimizes and gives attention to blockchain as a foundational technology. It also establishes an exit potential and market potential for blockchain or crypto asset based companies. It, it establishes multiples and valuations for them, since this is the first one uh, of the crypto asset companies that have gone public. So my friends, whether you like it or not, whether you understand it or not, whether you believe it or not, this juggernaut in on its way. My name is Roop Singh, and let's talk about is blockchain an opportunity, a risk or a threat for you? In this lecture, we will look at some recent trends, understand and ground ourselves on a basic definition of blockchain that we can all operate from, understand the distinction between crypto assets versus blockchain, uh, and we'll also look at when does blockchain make sense, a set of eight principles that you can take home with you. And we will also look at some frameworks to help you understand what can blockchain do for you in terms of a strategy. And then I will give you eight categories of predictions. Yes, I will stick my neck out and see how they perform. Then we'll talk about challenges. Are we there yet? So on that note, let's take a sense of the room here. Could you pull up the first poll, please? Thank you. On a scale of one to five, how well do you understand blockchain as a technology? And a related question, on a scale of one to five, one being beginner and five being expert, how well do you understand blockchain as a strategy? Go ahead. Cast your votes. And Dr. Ben, I can hardly see the, the poll results. So if you could just tell me where does the room lie on these two questions? A host can't vote, Roop. <clears throat> so oh. I, I am... Uh, uh, the, the processes will have to be seen after when the polling's done. There oh, there go. it is. There you go. Okay. So good spread. Wow. More, more people understand blockchain to be a strategy than a technology. That is new. Usually it's the other way around. But this seems to be a more business-focused room, I guess. Well, thank you for sharing your words. You can see where the room stands. So imagine that you were back in the 1800s, right in about 1860s. The railroads are being developed and it's a time of political turmoil for the United States. The time to send mail from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific coast of the United States was about 25 days using horse ridden buggies. Now that was considered to be good enough at that time. And then one day an entrepreneur decided to change that. He said, I will make this time shorter. So what he did is designed a system of horses and riders. The distance about 2000 kilometers from the rugged terrains of Nebraska and Utah and Wyoming and California. There was a set of over 150 riders that would ride, ride about 75 to 100 miles. Uh, and they would change horses every 10 to 15 miles. And that allowed the mail to be delivered from Atlantic coast to the Pacific coast in about 10 days. And that was a major improvement. Nobody believed it at that time, but Pony Express could do it. About the same time in 1860, Congress had passed a law uh, asking for telegraph poles and telegraph technology to be established in intercontinentally. On October 24th was the first message sent by Uni uh, Western Union on telegraph. Two days later, on October 26th, the Pony Express shut down. It lost about $200,000 in that monies, that time's money. And it just obliterated Pony Express. That's a familiar story. It's a familiar story of technology-led disruption. It's also a story of American ruggedness and adventurism and pioneerism. And that's a story that you can ask Blockbuster and Netflix. 
It's a very similar story that we are seeing being played out in front of our eyes now. So let's look at some recent trends. JP Morgan tests its blockchain payments literally out of this world in space so that if any infrastructure for Bitcoin payments was to go down uh, on the earth, we still have space. PayPal expands the, their crypto business into the UK markets using Binmo. And it might just come soon to your doors in the United States. This is another huge news. China launched its own digital currency. Yes, a crypto-based digital yuan was launched and they have been testing it for about four or five months already. So this is not a surprise. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but think about what it does to the notion of dollar as a reserve currency and a, and a dominant currency. MasterCard and Island Pay launched the world's first central bank digital currency li linked card in pirate territory in Nassau in Bahamas. Let's talk about NFTs. An original Banksy painting has been burned and turned into an NFT and sold for over 70,000 pounds. Grimes, the artist, sold $6 million worth of digital art, essentially 10 videos as NFTs. A 10 second clip was sold for about 6.6 .6 million of your US dollars. And one of the most conservative organizations on the planet, BBC, is getting into blockchain tokens with Dr. Who. Good news for the collectible fans. And yes, your favorite, Tom Brady, is now launching an NFT company. So let's understand what is this blockchain that everybody keeps talking about and people are making so much money. What is this foundational technology? Blockchain to me is essentially a cryptographic secured ledger, a distributed ledger with a shared state. What does that mean? So let's take an example. If we 100 people in this room, metaphorically, were to create transactions amongst us, let's say I send $100 to Nicola and, and Nicola send $100 to Ben, and Ben send $200 to Pam because we all like Pam. We have a set of transactions here. Back in the day, when we started doing trade and commerce, we said we will keep record of our own transactions on tablets or, uh, or marble. And then slowly, we started on this model where we would trust a third party, also known as, known as banks, to say, why don't you keep a track of everybody's record and tell us when we ask you what the set of transactions are, what the, what the truth is for the moment. And that's how we started to do a centralized ledger model. But what now with blockchain, what we're saying is, let's publish these transactions in a metaphorical wall in front of us where we all can see the transactions at the same time and believe it to be the truth. So there is no discrepancy and we don't need to ask anybody, what is the level of transactions or what is the truth of the moment at that moment? And that essentially is a distributed ledger uh, or blockchain. So in other words, it allows us to do peer-to-peer -peer transactions without a centralized intermediary in between. So to simplify, when somebody asks you what is blockchain, it's essentially a distributed ledger plus encryption. Nothing more, nothing less. Now this notion or these ingredients that make up what we now call blockchain had existed before. Distributed computing has existed since we started the internet back in the 90s. And cryptography has existed since we have fought wars for centuries, not a new idea. But what was new is packaging them together in a thing called Bitcoin. In 2008, a pseudonym, Satoshi Nakamoto, we don't know if that person was a male or a female or a group of people, they published uh, a paper called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, which allowed a peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash to be transferred and, and transacted between two people without a third party or a bank. And it was done by combining the technologies of distributed computing, and creating a distributed ledger and cryptography. Here's a fun fact. Did you know 
that gold as an investment in these United States was actually illegal till 1974, not so long ago. Think about that. The asset that we now claim to be a base asset for currencies and so many valuations was actually not legal as an asset instrument in these United States till 1974. So the point is that time to time, there are new class of assets that emerge. And crypto assets are one such class of assets. The distinction between blockchain and crypto assets or cryptocurrency as we will look even further is the following. Blockchain is the foundational technology underneath this particular use case. But cryptocurrencies are just one particular use case of this technology. There are plenty of other use cases that we will look in a few minutes that allow uh, the world to be disrupted through blockchain. So that's the basic difference, foundational technology versus one particular use case. So imagine if we are making so much uh, value from just cryptocurrencies and crypto assets, imagine what impact other use cases of blockchain may have. This is the first one that we as a society globally have learned to adopt and learn to accept slowly, although surely. So imagine the impact the other use cases would have. Here's a way to understand it further. I've categorized three different areas, be it blockchain into cryptocurrencies as use cases, and you will see familiar names there like Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin Cash, Stellar, EOS, etc., and tokenized crypto assets. You could tokenize real estate, the buildings that we live in. Uh, you could tokenize commodities. You can tokenize fine arts, the NFTs we just talked about, uh, or collectibles we just talked about, or equities, all kinds of shares and bonds, etc. Or you could use blockchain. Uh, in multiple industry use cases, in agriculture, in automotive, in insurance, healthcare, manufacturing, uh, public sector, retail, etc. So the question arises, what is a valid or a feasible use case for blockchain? When does blockchain actually make sense? So let's look at eight principles. Automation. To me, blockchain is essentially and more effective way of business process automation. I come from the business process world and what blockchain does, it forces you to look at an end-to-end -end value chain and see which partners of this value chain do you want to have in that network, who actually adds value and allow only those parties to exist and make your end-to-end -end value chain more efficient. It forces it via technology and it forces it via consensus mechanisms that the parties can agree with. It also allows for certain qualities. As soon as we publish transactions onto a blockchain network, they cannot be changed or altered, which allows us to think of them as immutable, which in turn gives us auditability. We can go back to these transactions and figure out when was this published and uh, what the transaction was. It also allows us provenance. It allows us to record a history of this so-called transaction, which could be an asset, any asset. We are coming from a world of centralized applications and centralized governance to a world of decentralizations. So there are two things to think about. We are talking about decentralization in terms of computer networks, the underlying uh, network that allows, you know, for us to talk right now, internet is essentially a set of networks uh, or allow for any transactions to go through. We're moving into an era of more decentralization in those networks. Bitcoin is a perfect example of, a, of what would be called a fully decentralized network. I think we will not achieve that ideal in a lot of other applications, but what you will see is there are protocols being developed for other uh, uh, use cases, apart from just peer-to-peer -peer cash, which are further decentralized. I'll give you an example of Filecoin, which is a protocol specifically 
to trade, to sell and buy memory or extra memory sitting in your computers. Look it up. The second way to think about decentralization is in terms of social networks. So here's the way. When internet first came around and you all started using YouTube and Instagram, it decentralized content creation. Everybody turned into a content creator, which was only uh, the bastion of studios before that. Or if you talk about newspapers, everybody uh, turned into a journalist or a blogger, which was only the bastion of uh, certain news organizations before that. So we have decentralized that model. And now we will see further decentralization of it. An example would be everybody, as, in, as Instagram turned everybody into a, a content creator, NFTs will now turn everybody into a royalty earning artist. Disintermediation. Cut the middleman. If they don't add value, they should not be part of my network. And that is a direct threat to a lot of companies whose value proposition is essentially to be in the middle and they shall be disrupted. Proof of ownership. Who owns this piece of land? Land ownership is one of the fundamental pillars of economic development globally. The question is how do you determine land ownership or for that matter, ownership of any asset, your car, your phone, your, your house. All of that can be done now better with blockchain. If you think about developing countries, and this is a case that I've dealt with personally, your, let's say your great grandfather passed on an ancestral piece of property to your great grandfather, to your grandfather, and then to your father, and then down to the son. Where is that record kept? It's actually in a paper ledger in some old dusty warehouse in some dark corner. And it's very easy to change that one entry and claim that piece of land to be somebody else's. So how do we prove it? How do we ensure that land titles are transferred legitimately from one party to the other? And there is a long-term uh, over one's life course or, or generations record of it. Paper ledgers are being replaced by blockchain. Proof of authorship. Whose idea is this? Intellectual property and copyrights. The idea that I created this, how do you prove that? How do you ensure that somebody else understands that that is who you, the, the copyright or the trademark or the intellectual property belong to? So in my opinion, all uh, intellectual property mechanisms like patents will eventually be on blockchain-based networks. It all brings us to a couple of central finer uh, points. Transparency, the ability to look through, the ability to say, yes, this is the set of transactions that we believe all together as a set of truth. And it allows us to create trust. Basically trust and transparency in an increasingly automated world through blockchain. So the trust is moving from companies or governments to something called the chain. So here's a framework for you to think about when you're thinking of use cases for blockchain, explore if your use cases satisfy one or many of these principles. And if they don't, perhaps it's not the best use case for blockchain. But to me, blockchain is more than merely a technology. There have been technologies that have come, but blockchain is a strategy to me. So here's a framework for you to understand what can blockchain do for you? On a tactical end, it can replace old legacy technology stack, reduce technical debt. It can automate inefficient, disparate processes residing in multiple legacy system. And as you go on the strategic end, which is, which is where a lot of exciting things are happening, it can reconfigure your partner relationships across your supply chain and it can deploy a shared layer of trust to, to share data in a secure manner. It can enable growth. It can bring new 
products into market. In fact, it can redraw verticals and create new business models and create new markets, which is what you see with a new set of parallel markets with crypto assets. Here's another view to understand what can blockchain do for you. It can protect intellectual property. It can monitor and verify your chain of asset. And it can transfer digital or physical assets more seamlessly than the business processes of today. So as you take all that in, think about all the potential use cases, all the industries that could utilize this technology. These are industries in the path of the chain. And, and these are representative. There are probably a lot of others that I have not even listed here. So this juggernaut is moving. But blockchain is not alone. It's not gonna be sufficient alone. The future of business applications will have the following stack. A sufficiently or moderately decentralized blockchain platform at the bottom to share data security and to establish immutability and provenance of assets. Layered with smart contracts, which will automate a lot of the business logic. And then, we will layer it with augmented reality and virtual reality, as you've seen in the case of uh, NFT applications. Then we will layer it with artificial intelligence, data analytics, and business intelligence. So I am not of the view, as a lot of people in, in this space are, that blockchain alone can solve all the problems of the world. It does some things well, and those are the only things it does well. It does not have superior powers uh, like spiritual powers or, or making, ra making rain come down and wash the pollen away. Let's look at some predictions. And I'm gonna stick my neck out and make these and you tell me if you believe them. We will go through them in detail. These are a couple of busy slides, but look at these eight category of predictions. I believe we will live in a world where all trade finance and retail payments are executed on smart contracts and blockchain based payment network. Everything that is physical and virtual is monetized as tokenized blockchain based digital assets and is traded on thriving peer to peer data sharing exchanges, not dissimilar to Coinbase. Tokenized securities, all stocks, bonds, real estate, private funds, commodities, are essentially blockchain-based digital securities cryptographically secured. And they are also traded on both public and private markets for these uh, uh, as exchanges, which are more than likely peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces. Web 3.0, we're moving from an era of cloud computing and a technology stack, which we call Web 2.0, into always-on computing on high-performance decentralized network enabling a parallel internet distinct from the Web 2.0 stack. So a lot of the successful companies that use what Web 2.0 today will eventually move to this paradigm. Accounting as a function will be performed on distributed ledger based platforms. All supply chains, be it physical or data supply chains, will share a single source of truth amongst business partners on blockchain platforms. Di distributed ledgers become the underlying secure data sharing layer for all critical IoT and autonomous device data. A few more. All forms of identity and ownership, be it government issued identity, company issued identity, biometric or your genetic identity are managed and shared via blockchain based platforms. We move towards more data sovereignty for users with users having more control and consent over their data. And if you think about latest moves Apple is making in the privacy and, and user uh, uh, control space, you will see the trend growing. Blockchain platforms become a de facto registry for all intellectual property. So all forms of title rights, be it your cards, uh, your real estate, uh, art in forms of NFTs or music, even in streaming, and all video, including movies that you watch, are managed on blockchain enabled platforms as intellectual property. The architecture of money is changing. Central bank digital currencies and stable 
private currencies like DM from Facebook are existing and consumers have choice to, in, to interact and transact in CDBCs and private stable coins. And that in fact is fueled by geopolitical power struggles and it further fuels geopolitical power struggles in the world that we live in. We are getting into a world of decentralized finance from a world of transfer of money, FinTech over the internet to a world of decentralized finance, transfer of value on blockchain networks. All traditional financial services like lending, remittance, trading, yield farming, insurance, derivatives are regulated in thriving markets on a decentralized finance platform. And these platforms are essentially new rails and infrastructure that are created by a new set of players like Coinbase perhaps, or a lot of others, and are a new set of markets distinct from the current public and private markets that we have today. So I've said a lot and I've stuck my neck out. The question for you is how much do you believe me? Could you pull up the new poll please? Rup is off his rocker. He needs to take his medication and pollen has gone into his brain, brain marrow. They're unlikely to come true. Some will come true. Most will come true or all of them. And I'm aligned with this vision. Where do you lie? And note that I have not given you a adoption timeline for all of these predictions. I don't believe they will all happen at the same time. Each of these sub use cases, if you will, will have their own adop adoption timeline. So take a moment and poll. I'm curious to see what you think. Interesting. But half the room says most will come true. 11% say all of them will come true. Nobody said Rup, Rup is off his rockers. That's interesting. Some will come true, say 41%. Okay, fair enough. We can debate which one those are. I believe all of them will come true. So as we start to wrap up, Here's a quote that I wrote in 2017, and this is just here as a jumble of words to make you believe that I'm smarter than what I'm actually at. So take a moment to read this. Moving on, it's not all rainbows and sunshine. There are challenges. Scalability, it's a boogeyman that's been tied around blockchain networks for a while now. And my position is that we have solved for scalability depending on which use case you talk about. And most of the time when people bring this boogeyman of scalability, they are actually talking about the Bitcoin blockchain, which perhaps is not the most scalable one, but you know, the first steam engine wasn't that efficient either. There are a lot of new networks and platform that are much more efficient and we are developing more efficient ones. I also think that we are in the second phase of evolution uh, being 2008 to let's say 2020 being the first phase of evolution of this space. Now we are coming out of the crypto winter and sort of the trough of disillusionment with blockchain applications and coming to a new recognized uh, uh, expectations that are more tempered and now we're starting this new phase in 2021 where NFTs and DeFi's and, and, and crypto assets are gaining a lot more adoption than we ever thought they would. Technology maturity. Protocols are still in their middle school. We will develop them further. Smart contract platforms are in their diapers. We will develop more efficient ones. And there's not many applications off of blockchain that you can say are truly adopted. Security. Tell me it can't be hacked, I'll show you how to compromise it. It puts up a target. What, what's important to realize here is blockchains are more secure than traditional centralized mechanism of storage, but they are not completely tamper or resistant proof. 
I call them they're more resistant proof. They're, they're not completely secure. They could be hacked given you, if you had enough uh, hash power or computing power to uh, bring down a certain network. And for smaller networks, this is an issue smaller or less decentralized networks. There's hardly any standardization. Uh, there is a regulatory risk. Uh, you know, Globally, if you look, some countries have a very liberal point of view on this and some uh, are on a very conservative side. If you look through, uh, I wrote a paper in, in uh, I think 2017 or 18, uh, one country's ban will be another country's boom. So countries will choose where they land based on their politics and their understanding of the space. Uh, but you will see that more appealing jurisdictions will have more projects and more companies coming out in the space. Innovation will not stop. It is a global movement. Market will mature as we see with Coinbase, uh, more, more money will flood into the space and more interesting startups and more sophisticated platforms will come out. And slowly we'll get to what is mainstream adoption. Are we there yet? Perhaps not. So the question for you, ladies and gentlemen, is the following. Do you want to watch this space being played on your screens as spectators? Or do you want to jump on the field and be players and make the plays happen? And for you to do that, you might have to understand a few things deeper. So we're thinking of offering a potential course called Blockchain Strategy for Business Leaders, a completely online course with these 13 extensive modules. We will go through technology modules like distributed ledgers foundations and, and cryptography and blockchain architecture, but we will also understand frameworks to grasp market trends and dynamics. How is this shape, how is this space taking shape? Uh, we will understand disruption models. Uh, we will understand uh, smart contracts. We will look at themes like identity and, and privacy and tokenization and digital assets. And we will also understand use cases in enterprises and how different enterprises are utilizing blockchain for business process improvement, uh, for value addition in their supply chain, uh, and to create a more visible trustworthy network among their supply chain partners. And then we will understand how to grow your ecosystem. This is a topic that is very uh, important for your adoption risk, but most uh, people that teach blockchain do not cover this because they focus a lot on technology. To me, even a superior technology is not worth anything. Only adopted technology is worth something. And then we will look at how to evaluate blockchain companies through a, a, a proprietary model that we have created to predict success of your blockchain projects or evaluate them for investment purposes. Then we will bring it all together in business model design, which combines all of these and asks you to use frameworks to design your own business model based on the use case you started with module one. So this is a potential course that we are thinking of offering. Uh, and you can indicate your interest in the post survey uh, that Emory Executive Education will send you. Just a shameless plug. I've been working on a book for the last three years and Dr. Ben Kaczynski has been an advisor and, and somebody who's been pushing me to write the book. Uh, and he's been great to work with, and he has agreed to uh, write the foreword for the book, the title of which is Profits in Chaos, Blockchain Strategy to Sow and Survive Disruption. If you like, you can go to profitsinchaos.com and sign up for release updates and discounts. With that, I thank you. Open for questions. Thank you. Uh... Thank you very much, Roop. I uh, appreciate the comments and your insight as you've been a long time observer and more than an observer, a thought leader in, in monitoring the evolution of the crypto technologies in general and how they manifest themselves in the various, uh, various venues, not only digital currencies, but in other domains that we spoke of last time in um, in our session that deals with the 
the uh, decommoditization as you see the NFTs growing and also deals with the radical disruption, the decolonization of uh, markets and, and uh, governance structures. And we have a, uh, a long, long bevy of questions that have cropped up in the Q&A that I'd like to relate and have uh, you voice a, a view on. Uh, many of them uh, came up and you address some parts of it later on in your, uh, in your address. But one of the points that was uh, first brought up by Sonia Voss was the, uh, as relating a story of the hazard of things being shut off, the lack of controls creates a prominent risk of governance for the, uh, the relationship structures, not the back end, but the front end. And in fact, uh, she lost connection because of an undisciplined interface. And uh, uh, with that governance, should, was she better served by going into gold and silver and material goods than in the digital space? So well, what's the question, Dr. Ben? Well, the, the question is there's huge anxiety about the lack of controls, the, uh, the, the expectation. It's the Wild West, uh, which is good, and it's the Wild West, which is bad. And that somebody can pick up and leave and shut you off and not return your calls and you lose all access. It's one thing when you have a sovereign state structure and sovereign state governance and the banks and gyro systems that are disciplined to respond and, and insured. And, uh, and these are not yet so. Yep. And, and uh, so a, a person you connect with, a, what if Coinbase shut down tomorrow and left you hanging? Right. So fair question. Three thoughts come to mind. One, this is technology-led evolution. At one point, I don't know if you guys uh, know, in, back in 1800s, there was a law called the Red Flag Law, when automobiles were first being driven or, on streets, and this is in England, where the, the law said, one person has to carry a lantern and a red flag in front of an automobile to alert people that an automobile is coming. We have come from that era to flying airplanes and drones. So as we evolve, we will develop self-regulation and also government-based regulation. Point two, one thing to understand about this space, and a lot of people miss the point and sometimes conflate things, this is technology, yes, but this space has also seen de development of technology and ecosystems based on certain different set of values. Technology itself inherently does not have a value or does not pr profess to have a value, same way uh, the car doesn't care where you drive or the pen doesn't care uh, what you write. The value lies in the consensus of the community. And these technologies have been developed through a different set of values that are sometimes even looked at as direct opposition to the current set of societal values that we are living. And one of them is that a lot of these, uh, a lot of people who developed uh, and, and are still pumping it, uh, time, effort and money in the crypto world, think of the current financial systems as rigged. They don't believe in that level of, of regulation and, and that kind of regulation. And they think regulation is for incumbents not to protect investors or consumers. So my sense is that as the space legitimizes further and as we have more adoption, which we're now seeing, there are two things that will happen. One, there'll be more interest from regulators to have meaningful, hopefully, regulations. And two, there'll be more self-interest from these companies to not leave somebody hanging because they have consumers and they depend on those consumers, their reputation is at stake and the whole industry is at stake. As I said, the narrative of, of Coinbase valuation is not just a narrative of one company that's a digital asset exchange. It's a narrative of an entire new space coming of age. So they are custodians of that. Does I that think make sense? The, uh, the um, dramatic story of uh, uh, GameStop and uh, the Reddit, uh, Reddit players and Robinhood and others uh, re 
uh, reflect on that issue of rebellion against the incumbency and the quote rigged game of the incumbents that uh, we're, we're seeing play out in many different dimensions. So that, that's uh, certainly very important. Several questions related to the expectation or aspiration to stabilization on the currency, on, on the valuation. And that um, will it be a viable uh, currency while it's still so volatile with uh, seemingly uh, not market influences on, uh, on that volatility? Or, or right. true economic influences. Right. So I assume that the question is more about Bitcoin, although you haven't said that word. Yeah, right. Let's start with that. Right. So will the volatility ever go away? Perhaps. I, 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 I don't know. I think you cannot argue with the markets. These are new markets being developed. And, and in some ways, we should be okay with volatility. That's a dangerous game to play for some people. So, you know, choose if you want to play in that game, but that's how the markets develop. There, there, there is a natural uh, process of evolution that we should allow for it to happen. Having said that, I, I, I'm not saying that customers or, or investors should not be protected. I think regulators, uh, particularly in the United States need to clarify a lot of regulations. Uh, and they need to look at regulations in two sense. One, their existing role as, um, custodians of uh, investors and consumers uh, rights and, and, and interests, but also they need to look at these regulations in terms of global competitiveness or US competitiveness. I believe if US does not clarify regulations in a meaningful way, especially with what, what the level of adoption that we see happening now, US and, and American consumers and American investors, we will be left behind. Uh, I believe China and, and some other countries are actually leading the way uh, in, in adoption and, and belief and in, in buy-in into these technologies. So, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, just to wrap up that point, uh, don't look at just Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin, think of it as, uh, as a store of value, which is what it's turned out to be now, rather than a currency. There will be a stable form of currency to be used on the internet. And that will evolve and we will all live in that world. And maybe DM would be that, you know, but I think there'll be more that'll come up and it could be a currency by a central bank. Well, that also relates then to another part of the question that Han Yun Kok uh, asked and, um, and others as well. That rationalization and may lead back to the sovereign state governance and lead back to some of the paths that uh, uh, fostered the rebellion. And that, for example, in taxation, that uh, will be that visibility, that, that oversight and control proffers a, 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 a taxation exposure. Yeah, fair enough, it, it might happen. I mean, that's, that's up to the governments globally to figure out uh, how they want to encourage innovation at the same time, make sure uh, investors are protected and at the same time um, tax. And, you know, and if people don't like that kind of taxation, they will move to tax havens. That's just how it is. Uh, and, and we've already seen, if you see uh, 2017, 18, a lot of people moved to Puerto Rico for this reason. A lot of crypto millionaires and billionaires are, live in Puerto Rico and, and, and fund the space. <laughs> and certainly when we look at the beginning of the internet and early days of electronic commerce, especially in the Clinton administration that established a uh, prevention of taxation of, of EC goods because it was getting, uh, it was starting to get to a point where any governor of any state that the message crossed wants a piece of the uh, of the transaction. So the moratorium that was put on by Clinton, renewed by Bush and uh, later uh, adjusted under Obama that uh, to foster the development, certain protocols uh, had to be put in place that would have defied normal regulatory in, in, uh, in incurring on, the, uh, on that process. Question related, uh, also to the uh, 
ambiguity, lost keys. It's a crypto structure. You get lost keys. What's my, what my, uh, or should there be insurance against that kind of thing? And as a victim myself of early days of pre wallet uh, and lost losing a key, uh, which I'm not bitter about, of course, although I've mentioned it every time we've spoken <laughs> that, <clears throat> that um, we, we do have that kind of exposure because of the crypto side that it's a lot based on keys that need to be protected or can or should there be insurance government? Yeah, so two thoughts. One, the whole space was developed with the belief, your keys, your assets, meaning no third party custodian. Uh, if you own your keys, you own your asset. So think about it in a way that these assets are actually not being transferred, literally speaking. They are more like a PO box where you have the key to open the PO box uh, and a public address that people can send letters to in that PO box. So that's the philosophy behind it. To answer your question, I think there are solutions being developed. A lot of people depend on exchanges these days, you know, like Coinbase or, or others. Uh, like Kraken or, or uh, Binance, et cetera. So th that is being solved for. And I think there will be insurance developed, uh, you know, companies will see the value in, the, in those products and, and consumers will, will, especially if you're a heavy investor, you would like to keep the custody of your uh, assets to a third party. And you may choose that. There are, you know, look at Fidelity. Fidelity has been offering custod custodianship of digital assets for a few years now, and they're about to offer it publicly to, to uh, all of their clients. Sujay, to uh, Tarakia, uh, raised the issue about the energy question that uh, often comes up, that there's, this is getting very expensive to support this crypto from an energy consumption standpoint and possible impact on the environment and climate. Right. So. The first steam engine wasn't that efficient. And the first blockchain network called Bitcoin is not that efficient. Agree, no, no debate there. But that's not where we stop. We have been, the rate of innovation in this space is very high. If you could even see the type of technologies that are coming now, the, the, the layer two uh, protocols, uh, the new type of consensus mechanisms, et cetera, we have found better ways to do things and we will keep developing that. And I, I trust that that evolution will happen uh, for multiple reasons, one of which is usability and adoption. If these networks don't become usable in, in practical terms for consumers on one end and for investors on the other, they just won't survive. There is a natural market-based evolution to that. Uh, secondary, uh, there, there are use cases that require more efficient networks. For instance, I mentioned IoT. Now, if, if somebody told me I will run a IoT or autonomous device uh, a data network using a Bitcoin blockchain, I would say that is an inefficient use of the technology. So there are other mechanisms like uh, 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 acyclic graph mechanisms that are, that are in the umbrella of distributed ledger technologies that are being developed for particular more efficient use cases. Is there a hazard, one question came up, is there a hazard of a great reset that evaporates? These are digital assets, they sound, uh, feel very ephemeral to people and very much at risk. Can there be a great reset? Right, so I talk about this in my second TED talk, uh, which, or TEDx talk rather, which, which you helped me craft, Dr. Ben. There is this idea that we are crossing over from a world of physical into a world of virtual. And that is true for the people of a certain vintage. If you talk to younger people and kids these days, they actually don't have that line that we think we're crossing. To them, virtual world is the real world. So from a philosophy and, and psychology standpoint, I would like for you to consider that. The second part, could there be a reset? Yes. I mean, there is a risk. If you, if you look at cybersecurity experts, there is a huge risk of, of uh, cyber threats around the world. Could that be a reset? Perhaps, I mean, we, we didn't think a pandemic could stop us down. So I'm not gonna rule that out, but what I do know that we are resilient. We are resilient and, and, and we are thoughtful and we are creative and we will come out of it no matter what the reset happens to be. 
So we still want to diversify. I, I think that's going to be our last question given uh, given time right now. There are actually a plethora of more more questions. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time. And uh, and Pam, let me turn it back over to you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ben. Thank, thank you, you Roop. Yes, thank you, Roop, and thank you, Ben, uh, for being with us this morning. There were so many questions, so thanks to all of our attendees for the great questions. Uh, we will use some of those to continue the conversation on LinkedIn as we move forward. We'd like to share just a couple of things with you before you head off for the rest of your day this morning. First are our next two upcoming Business Over Breakfast webinars. Just a reminder, we've gone to the first and third Thursdays of the month. So upcoming on May 6th, returning is one. Another favorite has been the Economy and Me discussion with Tom Smith, and he'll welcome back his friend, Bill McKinnon, to talk about what post-pandemic life might look at and to give an update on what's been happening since he was last with us. And then on May 20th, David Knorr, who is a Goizueta alum and somewhat of a futurist and a strategic relationship builder, um, will be talking to us about Curve Benders, a roadmap for your own reinvention. Then I'd like to share just a couple of our upcoming short courses and workshops. Um, and as Nicola mentioned at the start of our webinar, we have Structured Problem Solving, which will be kicking off in May, followed by another round of our Executive Coaching Diploma and Leading and Inspiring Change starting in July. And we had such a popular uh, response to Jamie Turner when he was with us that the Unspoken Rules of Leadership will be starting on April the 30th. Uh, in the chat, you'll find ways to register for these and other programs. You can find more information on Emory Executive Education website uh, uh, there. 